Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! few of you, I can only take a degree of responsibility for, for, for things that play out on my programme but which aren't actually part of my programme. A few of you a little confused by Jacob Rees-Mogg's claim today that we're sort of paying tariffs on food that we won't have to pay after leaving. Um, all I can find is the British Retail Consortium, which represents the places where we buy our food. Um, and they have said that uh, the, the idea of leaving without a deal which would see the EU and the UK have to treat each other as World Trade Organization members. Um, currently, we pay no tariffs on £20 billion worth of food that we import from elsewhere in the bloc. About 80% of our imported food comes from the European Union. And if we leave without a deal, we'd be paying about 22%. On, on that food and, and any other food as well because we'd be trading under World Trade Organization standards. Uh, so maybe Rees Mogg knows what he's talking about. Maybe the British Retail Consortium know what they're talking about. But I'd remind you that they're both talking about retail. Um, strange, strange times. And the numbers he relies upon uh, generally come from the economist Patrick Minford who has said that under his positive analysis of Brexit, farming and most manufacturing in this country would be wiped out. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, though. The, the article I found uh, is a year old, so maybe things have changed. Yeah, right. In that intervening year. Uh, five minutes after 12 is the time. I didn't hear the interview. I apologise, but I, I, I obviously heard the clip that got played out half an hour ago, and I've, like you, just checked up on some of those numbers, and they don't seem to bear any resemblance to reality, as far as I can tell, but that wouldn't be the first time. I want to turn your attention next to something that I don't know what we file it under. It's a bit zeitgeisty, isn't it? It's a bit spirit of the age. I am an odd individual when it comes to cultural heritage because I'm not really sure what my, my mine is. I feel very British. I feel very English. I feel very Irish on different days. It's a, it's a curious state of affairs, which I never really thought was particularly important because I've always felt that the most important thing about me is what I do in my life how I behave. I was raised uh, uh, in the Catholic faith, and I'm not suggesting that everybody raised in the Catholic faith feels this way, as I guess Jacob Rees-Mogg would prove. But I was raised to try to treat others as I would like to be treated myself. I find the idea of food banks repellent. Um, I find the idea of telling women what they can and can't do with their own bodies um, equally repellent, despite the fact that the Catholic Church teaches that contraception is bad and abortion is even worse. So we all, I think assemble a moral framework in our lives that, 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 that is a little bit magpie-like. We, we borrow, we pick. I, I'd, I'd look more towards Immanuel Kant when it comes to the golden rule on treating others as you want to be treated yourself than I would the Gospel of Matthew. I think Kant evolved it a lot. But I've never really... I'd, if you if you turned up in a... In a I sort of my, what is my heritage? I, I mean, the, the colour, really? Am I supposed to be proud? of an accident of birth. I've never quite got my head around that. So I don't know what cultural appropriation is in this context. And I know that it is a thing, and I know that sometimes it is a bad thing, but some of the examples that pop up seem to be, frankly, bonkers. What we have now is a claim that the Israeli woman who won the Eurovision Song Contest on Saturday night has done something wrong by wearing a kimono. And I just want to try and understand better whether or not there's any validity in this accusation. It, it, it's happened with cornrows as well. I, I've seen when white people get cornrow haircuts, hairstyles, that's cultural appropriation. I, I never feel more middle-aged or, or more Middle England than on topics like this. And I always, because it's the way I'm made, I always try to understand the mindset, the psychology of people who now get angry. So I am a little bit confused and a lot ignorant about cultural appropriation. Somebody says that the Israeli winner of the Eurovision Song Contest committed some sort of cultural misdemeanor by wearing a kimono, and I, and I feel a little bit baffled. Why would I feel angry at this point? Surely I need to understand everything a little bit better before I decide whether I'm going to waste 
or employ an emotion as powerful as anger. I'm a little bit baffled. How can it be bad for her to wear a kimono? 0345-6060-973. What other examples have, have we had um, in recent years? You've got, you've got the one from this weekend, uh, Netta Barzillai, she's called. It's a very interesting contribution. The Met Gala, I don't know if you're aware of this. I don't know that any Catholics actually complained about this. Um, I think the Pope came out and said it was all right, but that doesn't matter. The Met Gala in New York on May the 7th had a Catholic theme. It did indeed have the Vatican's blessing, but some people who, who dressed up according to a Catholic theme faced screams of, my religion is not your effing Met Gala dress, which then takes a slightly odd view of what's important and what's not. Rihanna looked incredible in a kind of almost a bejeweled religious robes, um, and she, they were accused of some sort of cultural appropriation by nicking the Catholic costumes? I don't even know. Snapchat was accused of promoting digital blackface, which is when someone literally takes on a black person's ethnicity, usually in costumes. Um, this was after they released a Bob Marley filter, which imposed his skin tone and trademark beanie onto users' faces. So you'd put a photo of yourself through this, and it would then turn you into a, a Bob Marley lookalike. Again, cultural appropriation. There's a, a high school student in America who wore a red silk Chinese dress to her high school prom and attacked a wave or, or, or attracted a wave of online criticism for culturally appropriating the Chinese tradition. And if we go back a little further, Beyonce uh, had a video in which she dressed up as a Bollywood actress. It was in a Coldplay video. It was the, the, the collaboration with Coldplay, him for the weekend. And that saw her accused of cultural appropriation because her hands were covered in henna tattoos and she was wearing a sari. And apparently some of the hand gestures she made were linked to a classical northern Indian dance. In a way, it's quite refreshing for me to sit here and, and feel at the moment that these critics are a little bit too right on, as we used to say. But I accept that some examples of cultural appropriation, and I presume that there are some better ones than the ones I've just shared, hold rather more weight than these ones do. And, and that really is where I want you to lead me. So if, if you are furious and you don't really know why, there's plenty of other phone calls, phone-in shows you can, you can contact, say it's absolutely outrageous. You might want to say it's political correctness gone mad without having the first idea what any of those words mean. That's fine. You are very, very well catered for in the British media, particularly in the phone-in format. I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, James, but I'm furious. I would politely ask you to, to clear the field today for people who consider understanding to be more important than anger. What am I missing here when I say to you, this seems a little bit silly? OK, I'm not going to get cross, I'm not going to start shouting and uh, peppering the microphone cover in little bits of foam and phlegm. I just don't get it. Possibly there is some egregious offence here that I am missing. It wouldn't be the first time that I've arrived a little late at a party. It sometimes takes a while for the penny to drop. But those examples there, culminating in the Israeli winner of this weekend's Eurovision Song Contest, speak to me of a non-existent problem. So explain to me when cu cultural appropriation is a real problem, if you would, and treat me like as much of an ignoramus as you please, because if I've learned anything over the last couple of years, it is that the, I have lived my life enjoying privilege I had no idea existed. Speaking to people in the last hour, the simple privilege of being white, middle class, straight and male. The most honoured, the most privileged section of society for millennia. And, uh, of course, a lot of the Donald Trump-flavoured politics is built upon the idea that you might have to share a bit more, you old, white, straight men. You might have to share a bit more with black people, gay people, women. You might just have to share a little bit more of society's spoils. And, of course, that's where you end up building walls and shouting, lock her up. So, so I understand that side of things. I know what white privilege is. I know what class privilege is. I'd be stupid if I didn't. And maybe that is blinkering me. Maybe you're listening to this and thinking, James, the only reason you don't understand cultural appropriation and why it's such a bad thing is because you've lived such a privileged existence. You don't know how lucky you are. 
And for me to use an example of, of, of Irish, it'd be like me saying to you, well, I got teased for being Irish at school, so I know what it's like to be a victim of race hate. I, I, I mean, the, the, the level of delusion that I would need to say that to you. I've got an Irish son, and they used to call me Paddy at prep school. So I know exactly what it's like to walk the streets in fear of your life in Eltham or somewhere like that. Yeah, so park all of that and just treat me with a bit of patience, if you would, a bit of kindness. What is cultural appropriation? And when does, if it turns out to be a valid thing, which I'm pretty sure it must be, when does it become invalid? Is anybody Chinese really upset by an American high school student wearing a Chinese outfit to her high school prom? 0345 I'm not going to sneer and dismiss if you tell me that you are actually upset by it, but I am going to ask you to explain in a way that helps me to understand why. Because right now, I would even include... Uh, Beyonce dressing up as a Bollywood actress. I would happily include um, Netta Barzillai wearing a kimono. I remember a story from last year about students uh, complaining that a, a Mexican restaurant in their university town was giving away sombreros. And I don't understand, I genuinely don't understand what the problem is. Unless it turns out to be just another example of a relatively small number of people getting cross about something and then the columnists and the commentators and the pundits piling in uh, to get cross with the tiny number of people who are cross and then claiming that somehow this huge number of people who are cross with a tiny number of people who are cross, um, they somehow get to claim that people get cross too easily these days. That is pretty much the business model for most of the right-wing media now. There's 11 students who've complained about a statue. Here are 11 million commenters on the Daily Mail website complaining about the 11 students complaining about a statue. What do we conclude? People get so angry so easily these days. Who are we talking about? The 11 million readers or the 11 oh we're talking about the 11 students the 11 million readers are perfectly entitled to spend their entire lives in a fit of apoplectic rage cultural appropriation forgive me if this is an uh, an offensive inquiry but i have the right to make it what is it this this should be good actually um 03456060973 is the number you need to just help me come to a better understanding of cultural appropriation what it is and when it is a real problem because some of the examples that i keep stumbling across don't seem to me albeit that i belong to the most privileged constituency that this planet has ever seen the straight white middle class male um, they don't seem to me to be problematical. In fact, a few of you have pointed this out. Mrs O'Brien and I had exactly the same conversation. We watched the Israeli winner of the Eurovision Song Contest, and, and I, I thought she was a worthy winner. She was in my top three. But I said to Mrs O'Brien, Björk won't be very pleased about this, because she just seemed to be a kind of almost a Björk tribute act. It didn't cross my mind that she could be offending Japanese sensibilities by wearing a kimono any more than this high school student in America who became a social media scandal for the crime of wearing a rather beautiful red silk Chinese dress. I, I, I don't get it, but I'm conscious that that might be because of my background. Rachel, it says here you're in custom. Where's that? No, custom house. Custom house. What would you like to say, Rachel? Oh. Um, it's just in terms of cultural appropriation in general. Yes. Um, I think it's... Uh, okay, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. To don't, don't be, I'll give you... Just try and sort um, your phone out if you can. I don't know... I'm in the kitchen listening and I'm in the garden. <laughs> all right, well, should we say... First of all, let's say hello to your mum. What's your mum's name? <laughs> Kim. <laughs> Hello, Kim. It's a lovely daughter you've got. She's about to ace it, I can tell. Now, cultural <laughs> appropriation, what's going on? So for cultural appropriation, I get where you're coming from in terms of, like, not quite understanding it, but I've seen time and time again where you'll get, like, your Kim Kardashians of the world on the front cover of Vogue with pain rows in her hair, and then Vogue will call it, like, all oh, the new hairstyle of a lifetime or whatever. Yes. Or, like, a little trend that people are trying to do. And it's been within the black community for like centuries. Yes. But that, when it comes to like us wearing that kind of hairstyle at work, we'll get kind of funny comments about it. And we'll get questioned, or like I've got judging at the moment and my hair gets touched on a regular basis at work. Yes. By either people that I work with or just random customers that I see. And, and that's, 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 that's quite rude, isn't it? It's a, it's a. Yeah, it's rude. And it's just like this whole thing about wearing. The black aesthetic or women of color aesthetic as something to go by when you don't live do the living uh, because because, of, because well 
Yeah, because a, a, a white person can, can take it on or off, take it on and off with ease, whereas yeah, for you it's part of your identity. Yeah, exactly. So that's where, like... Does, does, doesn't it help? I, I mean, I, I am going to be completely honest. I've done enough over the years to establish my credentials as, as somebody who's not on the side of the ignorant, angry lot. So I, I am ignorant, but I'm not going to get angry. Do, does it not in any way help? I mean, if you are, um, what's the phrase? If, if people find you almost a, a curiosity when you've got your hair in dreads, therefore they touch you, then is there no argument that says... That's like me touching your hair. Like uh, no, I, which is... Uh, no, I haven't finished. I'm not saying doesn't it help when they touch you. For heaven's sake. <laughs> I can hear Kim... I can hear Kim fuming from the kitchen already. <laughs> what I mean is if, if, if people like Kim Kardashian do it and then a bunch of other people do it from a different background, a different ethnicity to you, then it ceases to be a curiosity and people cease to treat you in such a disrespectful way. Or am I sounding silly? Yeah, it's not... Um, I don't like being a curiosity. Yeah, but you the, you won't be a curiosity the more people do the same thing. No, because it's just weird. It's not your culture to kind of be taken like this. I think it's just really weird. Yeah, I... I'm, I, 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 I other, and it's like, it's not... And so should she never do it? Are you telling Kim Kardashian that she is not allowed to... She's not going to get touched like we do. Okay, I had to I had to drop a little bit of that because you used a bad word yeah. and, I, and I didn't want I'm Kim... Sorry. I didn't want Kim to hear it, Rachel, so I had to... I had to press the dumb button there. So let's say criticism. She, you, you get you get treated in a way when your hair is in dreads that a white person yeah, would not I'm, when their hair is in I'm dreads. Not, yeah, and I'm not here to be poked and prodded by people. Well, uh, no. Well, for me, that's discrimination and it's wrong. But in fact, the path away from discrimination is to recognise commonality and similarity, not to double down on difference. So I, I know that I'm probably sounding a bit... I won't mention any names, but... When I suggest to you sincerely that the way to stop that style being a curiosity is to see lots and lots more people have it. But then there's a whole other history that comes with it because people will still see the style, but not actually the history. Yes. When it comes to certain hairstyles and certain cultures, this is the problem. People just take the aesthetic, but don't do the homework on finding out why are people really annoyed with... Well, I'm trying to now, and I, 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 I yes, I, I, I get that, because you're describing yeah. something that's fundamentally unfair. So Kim Kardashian credits Bo Derek as being the inspiration for her cornrows, and you're like, hello? Yeah, and that's not, that's not fair. And, our cult, and it's like, a lot of black culture is sold. But then it's commoditized, and it's and it yeah. yeah but but then yeah. what's the answer? Because you can't go around telling people what hairstyles they can and can't have, can you? Well, no, you can't. You don't want to live in that world. You want to live in a world where no, people are allowed to tell you what hairstyles you're allowed? It's just a matter of understanding, because then it's just like there's this whole other argument when it comes Well, then to the like more Kim Kardashians do it, the more people like me are forced to work harder to understand it. Yeah, but then you no? have to be like... I guess so, but then also it's just the other side of it that I've heard of the argument would be like when black women wear weave or they have their hair straight or whatever... It's like we're trying to be white, and that's not a thing either. It's like we have to learn to assimilate to a different culture. Yes, yes. And even and navigate around the world quite easy. Yes, yes. No, I understand. So it's double standards. You're describing double standards. Like really, yeah. really quite vicious double standards. But, but I'm still not clearer on the appropriation side of it. How do you feel about uh, the, the, the Eurovision woman wearing a kimono? She's very white passing, though, so I didn't even know she was Israeli. I don't watch Eurovision. I kind of just... All right, but I've, I've described to you an American high school student who wore a red silk Chinese dress to her high school prom and got attacked online for cultural appropriation. Do you, do you agree with that? <laughs> so why is she wearing it? Because it looks gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 you, you, you've kicked us off perfectly. I'm very grateful to you. Give my love to Kim. Twenty and wash out that potty mouth of yours. Twenty-seven minutes after twelve is the time. Fatima is in Golders Green. Fatima, help me out. Hi. Hello. Um, I need to find parking again because I was waiting for you to speak to me, and I have to get somewhere, so I started driving. Oh, well, I'll let... No, I don't want that. I apologise. I've got this... I know other people have to take calls from from, from people who are driving, but but um, I, I disapprove of it. I was worried. 
I really do. My apologies to you, Fatima. If you pull over before one o'clock, we'll take your call, I promise. Sylvia is in Mitcham. Sylvia, what's going on here? Yeah. I have three wardrobes, Asian, African and European. Gosh. And I'm a great believer that the Asian and the Africans have the most beautiful colours. Can I ask what your ethnic background is, or is that not relevant to our conversation? No, it is, because I'm, um, my father's African and my mother was uh, also mixed race. OK. So there's I no Asian? Dreadlocks. You don't have any Asian? Uh, no, no Asian at all. Or European? I have, dreadlock I have dreadlocks. Gosh. Um, I have um, done it for European people. Uh, anybody that asks me, I will do it for them. So what, in your view, is cultural appropriation? There isn't. It's a compliment. Um, why should one race just have one thing? The world well, is for sharing. Yeah, but you heard Rachel say that if she styles her hair in a certain way, she gets treated almost like an exhibit at a curiosity shop, whereas when Kim Kardashian styles her hair in the same way, she ends up on the front cover of Vogue. I've had that. I've had people come up to me and uh, want to touch my hair, and I let them, and then I explain to them what... I've done my hair like this because I don't like combing my hair. Um, I will explain to them, they, they'll tell me, oh, I've heard you never wash your hair. Yes. And I say, but that's dirty, of course I do. And I'll, yeah, share. OK, this one from Ola. So, James, a hairstyle worn by black people can only be accepted if someone white makes it acceptable. Aren't we lucky to get that validation? She's right. Oh. But that she is really right. Right. And we have been um, criticised... How, well, that's the problem then, that. isn't it? That's the problem that we're not seeing. Or that yeah. If you look around and look at school to black school children, all of them are wearing wigs because they? they're brought up to be ashamed of their hair. And the way to remove that shame is for white people to have the same hairstyles. I can see logic in that, but I can also see why, why, where the offence lies, oddly. I guess this is not a binary issue after all, is it? If white people want to do it, that's their business, and I've got no objection. No, but... What it... I would like to see is that black children and black people are proud of their hair. We've been made to feel ashamed of ourselves yes. for how we look, for our colour, for our hair. Everything about it us has been made to look like we should be ashamed of it. Yes, and, and that, well, you could then cast the appropriation as a positive. It, 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 it removes stigma, and sh but then why do white people get to play the role of stigma remover? Why can't they be playing the role of stigma refuser? We've got to, as black people... Turner, I walk around with my head up high yes. and you're not criticising me. Uh, no, but I don't think people should way. come up and touch your hair for what it's worth, even if you don't mind it, oddly. It, I... No, let them. Let them. All right. It's a, if people are curious, at least that person that says to me, oh, because you have your hair in dreadlocks, you never wash it. I'm teaching her not to be ignorant. Yes, you are. You are. Or, or, yeah, you're just enlightening her. Um, Sylvia, what a lovely call. Thank you so much. I just very, very briefly, Ricky Gervais has tweeted on the subject, not directly at us this time, although he has been known to do that in the past. He writes, I remember when adopting, sharing and assimilating things from other cultures was the opposite of racist. And, and I, I know he's another white, middle-class, middle-aged, straight man, but I kind of see the sense in that at this point, but it's only half time. So I, I get my head around the notion with one caller on the issue of um, cultural appropriation, particularly with reference to what you would normally consider to be hairstyles that suit um, black people's hair and historically are more commonplace. A few of you are telling me that the Greek soldiers had dreadlocks two and a half thousand years ago, which I think is relevant. And then you get two in the same breath. It's amazing, really. Um, Rachel just needs to get over herself, writes Josh. I have dreadlocks and do not get offended when white people ask me about my hair or when they wear a similar style. And, and Dee writes, in the same minute, actually, not my job to make other people feel comfortable about my hair. And no, don't touch my hair. I am not a petting animal in a zoo. And here's the thing, right? This is, this is the curse of being O'Brien in 2018. Are you ready for this? This might actually make your head explode because it's so at odds with the prevailing winds in our society, both politically and socially. Are you ready for this? 
I can see some sense in both positions. I think the world just ended. It's not 100% on that side or 100% on that side. I can see some sense in both positions. But now I'm going to do something else that's desperately unfashionable. I suspect that my perspective is informed, at least in part, by my personal experiences and myself. So I suspect that if I had been born black, I may see this slightly differently. Or if I had been born gay, or if I had been born to poorer parents, I suspect the world might look different if I was living at a different point in it. So, two things. Number one, there probably is an influence upon my views and attitudes that speaks to my past. And number two, I can see an argument here where both sides are making valid points. That's, there it is, the polar opposite of the prevailing winds that blew us towards Brexit. Pick a side, defend it furiously, hate the other side as if it's going out of fashion. But I stress, probably the most important of those two observations is the one about my own past and privilege. So I'll ask you again, what is cultural appropriation and when does it become bad? Aid is in Camberwell. Aid, what would you like to say? Aidy. Hi, James. Hello. Yeah, um, basically, I just wanted to say, with the cultural appropriation, it just becomes an issue when it offends people that aren't defended when what has been appropriated isn't actually done by them. Yes. So, like the previous caller said, it's your hair, your cultural dress, your accent, even our skin colour, the language twang. And then when we get degraded for it and we're not defended for it, but it's celebrated when another ethnic group does it or social class, it does kind of breed some resentment. But then, like you said, there is the thin line between the appropriation and the appreciation. I think so, but I, I, I feel that you're better qualified than I am to say that. Can I ask for some examples of... of the first thing you mentioned, when you, when you, when, when you get criticised or you get attacked for doing something. OK, um, let's say, for example, I work in the corporate world and so when I come to work with a wig on, that's straight hair, that's similar to Eurasian hair, yeah. I don't get any comments, but if I come to work with my natural curled afro, yes. people want to touch it or they make comments and say oh, did you grow your hair or did you cut your hair? And then it's a bit like, you know that the 20-inch weave I wore the other day wasn't <laughs> mine. <laughs> you know, like, yes. I appreciate you're curious about how my hair's standing up like this when it was in a wig the other day, but I've explained it to you at the Christmas party, the and, summer party. And now I'm doing it again. And, and <laughs> then what, what happens if a white colleague comes to work with a kind of... Well, I have to suggest they come to work with an afro now, do I? Or not? I don't, do you see what I mean? When, when does appropriation kick in? The appropriation comes into it, for example, if... I can't... With the hair stuff, for me, as your previous caller said, yeah. I feel like because of what she said about assimilating, it, it's a question because... We well, dreads and people. dreads and cornrows are easier than, than afros, aren't they? Because yeah. it, I don't think it's very easy for many white people to actually suddenly produce an afro on the top of I their head. Question it. I would wonder why they came in with that afro <laughs> randomly to work. I don't know why. Well, then, but then that. cornrows and dreadlocks, I mean, they look cool on, on, I mean, on the right people. They look awful on some people, but they look very cool on some people, whatever colour they are. That is true as well, and that's the thing. I feel like most of the Caucasian people, Asian people I know with just lots, are some of the coolest people I've met. <laughs> and I feel like that's the culture of the hairstyle. Yeah. I may be stereotyping, but... And I, no, you're not. I just think that everybody is describing something that I can see as being bad, but they're not... And you're not describing cultural appropriation. You're describing a degree of, of insensitivity that you are exposed to because of your hair, and your hair is an intrinsic part of your ethnicity, and I'd go further and say, I can never understand what it's like to have hair like yours, and therefore, and therefore perhaps I'm curious about it. And I'd ask you questions about your hair in a way that I would never ask a fellow Caucasian person about their hair, because I... Am I sounding naive now? Because I, I know what it's like to have Caucasian hair. I don't know what it's like to have... 
I think a little bit, yeah. you are being a bit naive because we have been living together for hundreds of years now. Steady on, my wife's that... listening. <laughs> <laughs> As people. Oh, OK. <laughs> so I feel like certain questions, it yeah. is naivety, but it can come across... So, as so, so what we're not doing is live and let live. We're doing, yeah. I get to live and let live, but you get to live and answer all my questions about your hair, which is hundreds and hundreds of years old in terms of concept and style. Even the music, you know, you get asked, can you twerk? Do you like reggae, reggae sauce? And it's oh, just really? like... Oh, well, that, yeah, but again, that's not cultural appropriation. That's just either benign or malevolent ignorance. It's just ignorance, though. It's Isn't creepy, it? James. Yeah, it is, you're right. It is, but it's not cultural appropriation. That's what I mean, that the lines are so blurred because we are all easily offended. Everything's the culture, everything's an identity, everything's fluid, so... Well, that's what I thought, and that's why I can just about assemble my argument while acknowledging that it's a bit fatuous, perhaps, that one way towards making your hair less of a curiosity to your colleagues would be for more and more people of different ethnicities and backgrounds to, to, to have similarly styled hair. And then it ceases... Uh, but then it, not only does it cease to be a curiosity, it ceases to be special to you as well, and that becomes a problem, and that perhaps does look like appropriation. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Good it's Lord above. One. I think as people, we do need to be more proud of our natural state and maybe stop trying to assimilate and then we won't see such an issue with other people doing these hairstyles because it's not just an external issue. It's something we deal with as a race as well. I, I do, and, and I've got to be honest, I've just remembered something because Joe's just tweeted to say, who the hell are all these people who go around just touching other people's hair at work and stuff? <laughs> but, but I've just remembered a lad at college who had a real flat top. You remember, I mean, this is going back years. He had a real flat top, and I did. I went and touched it one day, and he really... He was a mate of mine, and, and it didn't damage our friendship, but he really got the hump with me. And I'm going to do that thing now, which is a bit like saying, well, I'm Irish, I know what it's like to be a victim of racism. <laughs> I, I, I had a ponytail at the time, believe it or not, and when I went into college with my hair down, looking a little like... Um, well, I felt I looked like Michael Hutchins. I probably looked more like Michael Bolton. But people would people would come up and touch it. But they were that was very specific to me. They would say, oh, look at your hair. Look at James's hair. It's different today. I'm going to touch it. When I went up to... I think the lad's name was Enoch, actually. I don't know. I haven't thought of him in 25 years. It just popped into my head. I went up to Enoch and wanted to run my hair, hand across the top of his flat top. That That's me saying, oh, look at the black person's hair. I haven't come... That's not specific to him. That's specific to his... Ethnicity. Exactly. It's a, a, a tough one. It is a tough it's one. And, 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 and I almost wish the conversation hadn't focused on hair because I'm beginning to understand that. I don't understand why wearing a kimono would offend people. Do you? Yeah, no. With the kimono thing, I feel like when it comes to, like, clothing, as long as she wasn't putting on a... No, well, you know, well, exactly, yes. It's the same with the yeah. lady in the Chinese red silk yeah. dress. You know, obviously, if they were doing a kind of, you know, um, uh, Peter yeah, Houston-off-style exactly. turn in All the Dinosaurs Are Missing or something like that, we'd have a different... Oh, gosh. I'm glad we're... You see, isn't it interesting that you can have really, really interesting conversations without anybody getting offended or angry? Yeah. <laughs> Moving in the right direction. 12.45. Um, Martin points out there's a difference between mocking another culture or, or simply uh, emulating it or celebrating it. Um, and that's part of the problem in pinning down precisely what cultural appropriation is. This is good from Tadiwa. The appropriation comes when black food or fashion is attributed to white celebrities or where they profit off bastardised aspects of the culture. And she suggests that when a chef like Jamie Oliver serves up his own version of rice and peas or jollof rice, then there's a form of appropriation going on. I understand the point you're making. Obviously, my deep, deep and abiding affection for Jamie Oliver makes it difficult for me to brook any criticism of the fella. But, I, I, I mean, even if it was a chef I didn't, uh, I didn't know, it, I would say, yeah, but that food would not have reached those eyes if it hadn't come via that source. Source. Ah, yeah, this, I, this is, by no means am I going to end this hour with a clearer view. No, with a clear view of where right and wrong is, but I'm getting closer. 12.50 is the time. I also think it's important to recognise the value of confusion, actually, rather than being 100% convinced 
that you're right or wrong and everyone else is right or wrong. Uh, just a little bit of confusion. As I said, I know it's a desperately unfashionable thing to say, but I can see validity in both sides of this argument. Mike is in Kingston. Mike, what would you like to say? Um, all I would like to say, really, is I think a cultural appropriation does exist. Yes. But I think if you... Um, the term is used quite loo loosely. It's more when you've got... When you're using someone else's culture, whether that be stars, dress, talk, and you're taking credit for that and not giving anything back. So say you're gaining financial... Like, for instance, Kim Kardashian, she got paid for that shoot, credit someone else with the with the hairstyle yeah. and didn't reference any of the culture it was taken from. How would she, how would you like culture. her, how would you like her to have done that? Well, uh, 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 to be honest, that's a bad example because uh, <laughs> Bo Derek, no, Bo Derek didn't have that hairstyle, but yeah. Bo Derek herself, if I remember rightly, it said she got it from, I think, somewhere in Africa style that she saw. So, it, but you can't be providing you can't be providing a CV every time you get your hair cut, Mike. Well, no, because that's a flash. But let's say let's say type of music. Let's let, let's take it away from black culture because I think it's focused a bit on that. On that, let's take it. Um, maybe like you adopted like I don't know a traditional Chinese music. Yeah. But felt, I made a whole album, would say, and filter in any way credit that culture. That's cultural appropriation. Yeah, but I mean, but 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 it's also, I mean, uh, the culture and art is is probably the most magpie of magpie like of things. You take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you know, and you you, you mix. Very much so. so by pretending that you'd come up with yourself, you'd have a problem. But that would be plagiarism almost for me, but, a form of cultural is, but plagiarism. That, but that is cultural appropriation in a nutshell. Well, give me that an example of that then. Um, I could give you a simple example yeah. that is quite comedic. Like um, Drake, for instance, did a near enough whole reggae album. And well, nothing, nothing was said on on the country it came from. And um, what do you that's mean? Cultural appropriation. So he's, he's again, we're talking the music. He's used um, he's used like a heavy reggae influence on his music production. Yes. A, a, um, a lot of financial gain. Now maybe you could have a few features, a few. So um, you'd, few you you you'd out. want to him to reference the Caribbean or something like that more. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, you don't have to, it's not even about a, uh, a monastery or just a little uh, a nod to where this comes from. Is that's all it takes for it not to be appropriating? But for, for instance, that lady on um, uh, on the Eurovision, yeah. she's not. She wasn't purporting to um, have designed this dress herself, and it's not now the most in thing because she's worn it. No, but everyone knows exactly where that's come from. So I don't know how you're appropriating that culture because it's very. Uh... Oh, your mate, yes, 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 yes. So it's the idea that if I did something, if I nicked something from people of right. colour or from Chinese people or from Peruvian people, made a killing out of passing it off essentially as all my own work, yeah. then that grievance would be real. Yeah, but you're wearing something... Like, if, so, if, if, if a white person wears dreads, we know where that's coming from. Yeah. You know, it's, it, you're, uh, how, how much appropriate could it be? Well, mate, it's with respect, person. Mike, I know where reggae comes from. Yeah, well, yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> God, every time I think I've just said the, the, the light has come on and then it goes out again because I know where right. no one needs a lesson it or maybe they do need a You'd lesson. You'd be surprised in because if we take that music, it's like the generation who's listening to that are a bit younger, so maybe they, they don't maybe know. they don't know. How did you? How old are you? I'm 25. Oh, I was hoping you were a bit closer to mine because I was going to ask you how. What about you? Be 40, having a white lead singer. Um. Well, here's the thing. Go on. Um. With the Windrush generation and especially the in Birmingham, and, yeah, and and the um, the UK, um, there's a lot of sound systems and a lot of uh, music style that has been birthed in the UK. So we're getting into a little a bit of a tangent now, but so when it comes to that kind of genre of music and the UK, there's a lot of link um, cultural things from the beginning so um yeah no I, no I don't think we are going off on a tangent what you're, you're describing a, a, what you could describe as a as a melange as a, as a, as a mixing yeah. rather than a take something like island records like people uh, let's say um britain has been integral to um reggae spread all over the world so you can't really just be like, oh, you can you can help with the production side, uh, the marketing, uh, but you can't in, you can't participate in the music. That would be a bit ridiculous. And and a lot of people um, are very very sceptical of the idea that that a kimono or a Chinese red silk dress could be 
um, filed under the same problem as some of the ones Mike described. I, I am as well. I, I, I wonder next time whether we'll try and focus on the frocks rather than the rather than the tunes, because I think we're reaching a degree of understanding on the tunes, but I'm still baffled by the frocks. Dwayne is in Chingford. Dwayne, what would you like to say? Yes, I would like to say that. Dwayne, mate, I don't know what you've done to your phone since you spoke to Beth, but there's no way she'd have let you through if you were talking to her like that. We'll try and fix it. Jar's in Perfleet. Jar, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. I'm trying to do it quickly in the five minutes. Um, not taken away from anything everybody else has said. Yeah. From my experience, there's been there's three types. You've got the offended. Those who, are, those who are not from the culture but offended about anybody that does anything for them. So they're offended, they're offended on their behalf and they tend to scream the loudest. Yes. Um, they're, they're quite a problematical constituency at very, the moment. But, but, but only uh, because we have other people screaming back at them, usually millions more. But, but yeah, I take your point. Offended on someone else's behalf. That's probably the majority of the kimono complainers. And then there's two more. There's the purists, and they're the ones that believe that um, we've been robbed of every single thing possible or as much as possible. Yes. And so, therefore, all we've got left is this, and they're trying to take this from us. We've got to hold on to it and stop everybody from taking it from us. Yes. Um, and, then, then, and then you've got the what I call the hypocrites. So we go back to the hair and, and Kim Kardashian. Yes. They're a, a big problem that Kim Kardashian's got cane rolls, but no problem that they're wearing weaves that's 20 inches long. Yes. And they can't see the difference. As far as they're concerned, we can... Is that hypocritical or doesn't that have something to do with power dynamics? So that if, if, if you have a dominant culture, then people from a minority culture will always try hard to fit in, whereas for the members of the dominant culture to, to, to kind of borrow for fashion reasons some of the attributes and characteristics of the minority culture, I don't see that as traffic moving in the same in opposite directions. I don't see that as equal and opposite. I see one of those things as worse than the other, but you see it as hypocrisy on the part of the... Yes. Uh, yeah. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you're, if, if I'm really upset about um, uh, somebody else wearing my outfits or dressing like me, then I, I won't do likewise. Because I don't have an argument. No, I think you're onto something. So, uh, 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 all right. Then at the end of this conversation, I would lean towards the conclusion that about 80% of the stuff I've seen described as cultural appropriation over the last few years is nonsense. And the responsibility for the amplification of the nonsense lies almost exclusively with that constituency you described as taking offence almost as a, as a professional, uh, taking offence on other people's behalf. And then I'd add a fourth category to this problem, actually, Jar, which is God. you and I would not even know about this kimono being accused of cultural appropriation or this red dress if people actually, much bigger, louder and more powerful people, weren't screaming their heads off every day in newspaper columns about how awful it is to complain about cultural appropriation. I would say leave those professionally offended people to complain about it in their, um, in their world but it's not a valid enough complaint for me to let it into my world. Correct. Boom. And that, mate, is exactly on the money. Were you keeping an eye on the clock as we did it? I was. <laughs> <laughs> Jar wins. I think you got your at the end, did <laughs> Do you want to introduce Sheila Fogarty, Jar? Go on. Oh, I'd love to. Go, Go on. on. And at the beginning of the hour, we will now no, have... Do it now, man. Do it now. Sure, she's doing it. Start again, start again. It's Fogarty. Okay. Try again. Go on. And on the hour, we'll be having the wonderful Sheila Fogarty to cover the next three hours. There you go. Okay. I have to miss Tata.